It's been quite a day. Thanks to all of you who've participated in today's sessions and have stuck it out to the bitter end. As of about 5 o'clock, we had 1,064 people through the doors. Participants about evenly divided between developed and developing countries, including more than 200 UNFCCC delegates and 57 representatives of the media. Not bad. We pioneered a new element of Forest Day this year with the issues marketplace. As I wandered through, I saw lots of small groups huddled together in discussions and business cards being exchanged. And if we could only extract a small tax on every one of those intellectual transactions, we wouldn't be rich, but we'd be really smart. Now, raise your hands and do the wave if you think the issues marketplace was a successful experiment and exper ex experience to build on in future forest days. All right. Well, the rest of you can just take a longer lunch break. Okay. Now, I'm not going to try to attempt a comprehensive summary of what happened today. We've had video cameras, rapporteurs, bloggers, voting tallies, and uh, reporters from the IISD documenting service documenting what happened for the website and for posterity. But I do want to share just a few highlights, in part for the benefit of Ms. Cristina Figueres, who has joined us here uh, from the UNFCCC Secretariat, um, to give her something to respond to. So, in brief, uh, having the 17th COP and Forest Day here in Durban has given us a particular opportunity to focus on the specific uh, opportunities and challenges here in Africa. And appropriately, we ended the opening plenary with a, a really moving video tribute to Wangari Mathai. Many speakers, in, speakers invoked her name, her words, and her legacy, that action is more important than just talk, and that it's not just about planting trees, but about protecting forests as well. Uh, minister Tina Jomwet Peterson, the South African Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries, started us off by reminding us that climate change threatens to undermine many of the development objectives of countries in Africa and in the rest of the developing world, in particular in the areas of water, energy, health, agriculture, and forestry. Both of our keynote speakers stressed what's important and what's different about the relationship between forests and climate change in Africa with a particular focus on the dry forests and the connections to agriculture and to adaptation. Helen Gichohi said, the disappearing forests, the overgrazed rangelands, and conversion to crop agriculture of grasslands and wetlands that had served as drought refugia have all diminished the resilience of the system. Her message was echoed by her fellow keynote speaker, Bob Scholes, who said, the next major wave of deforestation is already happening, and it's happening in Africa. He described the typical forest for deforestation and degradation here, different from the conversion patterns in other regions, with first the valuable timber being removed, then the charcoal manufacturers remove a large portion of the remaining trees, and then low input, low output agriculture arrives, after which a few cycles leaves the land degraded. So what to do? In plenaries and in discussion forums, a number of promising ways forward were identified, as well as barriers that need to be removed. I'm going to tick through just a few of these, because Christine is going to have to leave in uh, about 10 minutes, so I don't want to take her time. Um, Red Plus is seen as the greatest opportunity, but is accompanied by a large number of challenges. And the discussion forum on Red Plus on the ground voted on the relative priority of those challenges, and I encourage you to go to the website later to see those results. They're very interesting. One of the biggest challenges identified by everybody is financing, where it will come from, how it will reach the people who need it. Um, and in fact, those voters in the discussion forum on Red on the Ground said that uh, the most important action that could be taken by the international community on Red Plus was accelerate agreement on a financing mechanism for Red Plus in the UNFCCC. Um, another pro challenging area, safeguards. Um, at the discussion forum on biodiversity safeguards, I'm told there was consensus about the close synergies between the CBD processes and the UNFCCC much more, much closer than has been explicitly acknowledged, and that there is a close alignment being established between the program of work on biodiversity at the CBD and the UNFCCC Red Plus mechanism. Identification of capacity building needs suggests that there's a concern about social safeguards. Um, for example, in the Red Plus on the Ground session, they talked about actually the capacity building needs were more important related to governance and legal issues and local indigenous understanding of Red more than purely technical capacities. 
Um, and Tony Lavinia, who facilitates some of the Red Plus negotiations in the COP, suggested that the delay on getting specific on what information is needed on safeguards implementation might actually be a good thing, saying that, and I quote, it's better for us to have some experience on the ground first about what information is needed for reporting before we give detailed descriptions. Talk about MRV and reference levels. Tony described the Substa agreement uh, on reference levels as a breakthrough, which Forest Day participants um, agreed. 93% uh, of the voters said that reference levels are es agreed or strongly disagreed that reference levels are essential for moving forward with Red Plus. Um, another big theme of discussion, the forest agriculture nexus and the need for a more integrated approach. Caroline Spellman talked about how, how all of these issues are integrated, um, speaking that, saying that climate smart agriculture is not a panacea, but can help us address adaptation and mitigation and food security. Lots of issues related specifically to dry lands, um, characterized as a dry run for climate change, success being possible at reasonable cost with trees and landscapes and on farm, um, a, a drought proofing of livelihoods and a, a landscape based approach. Um, perhaps something of a selection bias reflected here, but 79% of the participants in the discussion forum on landscape approaches thought that substantial red funds should be invested in agroforestry, afforestation, and reforestation. And the greatest barrier identified being that the exclusion of agriculture of, from the CDM and Red Plus. Okay, um, a special session on, on, on Rio Plus 20 and an opportunity to merge the agriculture and forestry agenda more there, um, but also apparently Hans Bratzgar was quoted as characterizing Red Plus as the ultimate challenge for Rio Plus 20 with the potential to establish a pillar of global sustainability as well as an example of global partnerships. So with that, I am now going to introduce Christiana Figueres, Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. We're delighted that she was able to step away from her primary obligations of supporting the negotiations to be here to listen to those highlights and give us her reflections on the way forward on the forest and climate change agenda and any reaction to what she's heard from us. Ms. Figueres. Thank you very much, Jane. Appreciate the opportunity and uh, the invitation. Uh, I must say, I was, you can't see it, but um, there's two screens here, and I was watching Jane, and I thought, you know, I'm going to get up there and speak. I have never spoken with such a beautiful backdrop. Why don't we have this at the UNFCCC? Yeah, that, would be very, that would be very nice. Um, so thank you very much. It's uh, wonderful to, uh, to see friendly faces uh, in the audience. And I must say, for those of you uh, who have been with such perseverance uh, working on this agenda item, I'm sure COP17 feels like, oh, how many more COPs are we doing until we get all the decisions that we want? So I wanted to share with you, um, just two or three days ago, I was dashing from one meeting to another, and, uh, and I heard this wonderful gentleman standing up perched against one of the columns over there, speaking, looking very important into a cell phone, and he says, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't have time, I'm very, very busy, I'm here in Durban at COP71. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure this feels like COP71 to you. <laughs> because uh, you have been so patiently working with us on all of your decisions. Um, but, uh, but, but I do, I, I do actually rejoice that it is not COP71, that it is only COP17, um, and that we, uh, we are actually uh, able to take on some very important decisions. I, I thought I, um, you might profit from a very quick overview of uh, what's going on over there, because uh, this week has been incredibly productive. Uh, and I am really very heartened about the fact that governments have arrived here with a very serious commitment to uh, not just put forward their national positions, all of which we know, all of which each of them can speak for each other. They can just, you know, move to each other's uh, flag and, and uh, put out the speech. So that is not what they're doing. They're actually really beginning to listen to each other and to begin to bridge the differences. 
So where are we? Well, um, the subsidiary bodies, which are two of the six bodies that are meeting, uh, finished last night, very, very late. Uh, but they finished, they concluded, with some very important uh, conclusions and decisions that they're putting forward to the Conference of the Parties. Much of it has to do with the adaptation package, which we are very, very delighted about because there are several decisions in adaptation, and we knew that adaptation is not just important in and of itself, but it is politically absolutely crucial for a COP that occurs on African soil. Uh, and so we are very delighted that that whole package, which is actually a package of four different decisions, is moving forward. One is a little bit stuck, but, uh, but uh, we're confident that we can move it next week. So uh, we're very happy about that. We're also very happy about the fact that under the long-term corporate action under the LCA track, the chair put out uh, a draft text. Now, the uh, negotiators don't accept it as a draft text, so it is the proposal, no, it's, wait a minute, it's the amalgamation of a possible draft text for a possible negotiating text, or something like that, i.e., this has no legal standing, don't worry about the legal standing of this text, just get into the issues and work on them. Uh, so that was a, a very refreshing approach. Um, and, uh, and, and also the fact that, uh, that we have that out on Saturday morning, it went out yesterday morning, so that negotiators have actually been reading it and I've met with quite a few of them during today and they are really doing their homework over the weekend and looking at that um, in order to uh, get ready for killing the text tomorrow morning. Uh, so we're, we're certainly ready for that one too. Um, and under the Kyoto Protocol, quite wonderful uh, because I must say countries have up until recently been discussing whether there is going to be a second commitment period and here in Durban it is very clear that that discourse has changed not to about whether there's going to be a second commitment period but how the second commitment period will be brought in. And uh, that has been done to no, uh, no small task through the uh, pol very important political bridge that the European Union has put uh, on the table. And uh, we thank friends in the European Union for, uh, for pushing that forward. Um, so now countries are really looking at, okay, what is that going to look like? What is the legal nature of that going to be? Will we be able to put Quellrose, I'm sorry to throw an acronym at you, quantified emission limitation reduction objectives, i.e. the same metric that was used under the first commitment period in the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but the good news is, yes, they agree that there is going to be a second commitment period. Yes, they agree that they don't want to allow for a gap, which is very important, no policy gap. Um, so people can, we can celebrate New Year's of uh, December 2012 because we know the next morning there will still be a policy in place. I was getting worried about my New Year's celebration. Um, and very importantly, very importantly, the recognition that the ambition that they have on the table today is important and completely insufficient. That is a very, very important political step. So they're looking at how do you put a second commitment period in place that will allow to uh, up the ante and increase the ambition at some point in time. Um, and on top of all of this, the canopy of all of this, that's sort of all of the trees and the underbrush, um, but the canopy that is being built over all of this is called the Indabas, which is uh, in a wonderful South, uh, South African or rather broader African tradition of bringing the elders of the community together uh, to collect wisdom from the elders when there is a difference of opinion uh, about an important issue and then in a collective fashion find a way forward. And that is being done by the South African presidency, of course, about the core deal. And the core deal is a second commitment period and we're still um, supporting that discussion to see what the details of that is going to be, but also how does that bring about then a broader mitigation framework that will certainly not be defined, but that will be refined over time, not be defined in Durban, but will be refined over time, uh, and we hope not over too much time. So what, is, what does all of that mean for you? Um, well, Tony, I'm, Jane tells me that Tony has already 
giving you the good news that SUBSTA um, has forwarded a decision on reference levels and safeguards, which are two of the very, very important pieces that uh, developing countries need in order to approach um, the implementation of these projects in a safe and also um, in a safe environmentally and social uh, manner. So we are very, uh, very happy about that. Um, still working on the financing, uh, still haven't quite come out of the uh, out of the forest on the issue about whether forests will be uh, have, uh, be able to access the markets or not, um, but uh, but we're in the hands of wonderful chair there, Tony Lavinia, and he's doing a, a very good job. So stay stay tuned for that. But bottom line, what is happening here? Bottom line, um, the almost 200 governments of the world are doing nothing less than writing a global business plan for the planet. Now, I get impatient because we're already at 71, um, and we don't have a global plan, and I'm sure you get very impatient because the decisions, the specific decisions that you want are not quite there with the detail that you would want them, but we cannot underestimate what is happening here before our eyes, and we can't uh, really underestimate the privilege that it is for all of us to participate in this process. For countries to come together, every single country with one voice, and contribute to the writing of a global business plan for the planet for the next 50 years, that is a mammoth undertaking. And it is particularly mammoth because it is very, very clear, has been for a while, but particularly here in Durban, it is now very clear that this business plan needs to be written with a triple bottom line in mind. One, mitigation, because we are in the face of runaway emission levels. Two, adaptation, because we're at the point in which every country has to adapt. And three, very important bottom line that has been added here in this African COP, the reduction of poverty. So I think that we now have, at least conceptually, in the uh, minds and the consciousness of governments, we have a very, very important tripod that they are using as their how do you say that in English? Compass, as their compass um, with respect to writing this global business plan. That is not an easy task. If you have to bring down mitigation quickly, increase adaptation and resilience quickly, and accept that the existence of poverty around the world is completely unacceptable in our century, and that this agenda can be used to help alleviate that poverty. That is actually, I would say that is sacred work. That is really what we should all be uh, working on. And I just wanted to point that out to you as clearly as that, because there's no doubt in my mind that that's what RED is all about. It's about mitigation, it's about adaptation, and it is about improving the quality of life, in particular, of the people who live around the forested areas. So you are working on an, they call it an agenda item. You're working on the core, if you will, the spiritual core of this global business plan. So I thank you for your patience. I know you want to clobber us many times because these decisions don't get uh, put on the table as quickly and as clearly as you would like. Uh, but believe me, there is a lot of, uh, a lot of really, uh, not only good intention, but commitment to do the work. I thank you for your perseverance. I thank you for your contributions. I thank you for the innovative thinking that you have brought to this issue uh, and to always be thinking at least three steps ahead of the uh, negotiators 
uh, who need uh, some inspiration from all of you. So thank you very much. Please don't give up on the COP. I hope we will never celebrate a COP 71 because I'm hoping that we will have solved this by then. Uh, and uh, I hope that you enjoy the rest of this week and stay tuned for more good news next week. Thanks. Okay, well, Christiana Figueroa stayed longer than she said she could, so we're very fortunate to have those remarks. Thank you. Okay, I understand that I'm now the second to the last thing standing between you and the cocktail reception and some outstanding jazz music, so I will be brief. But I will also be slower than I was in my previous remarks and take less of a slash and burn approach to my text, trying to get through it to give me Christiana's deadline. So now it is my duty and my pleasure to recognize the many individuals and organizations that have contributed to today's successful event. First, our thanks to the South African Department of Agriculture, Forestry, and Fisheries for its generous contributions as co-hosts of Forest Day 5 and the gracious words from the minister this morning. We are deeply grateful to your support. Second, our thanks to the many sponsors who are listed in your program guide who provided financial support to Forest Day. And these include the Norwegian Ministry of Environment and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Australian government's AUSAID program, the Congo Basin Forest Fund, DFID, the UK Department of International Development, PROFOR, the World Bank's program on forests, USAID, the US Agency for International Development in Southern Africa, FFPRI, Japan's Forestry and Forest Products Research Institute, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and the Climate and Land Use Alliance, or CLUA. Thanks to all of you. Third, thanks to the members of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests who contributed to Forest Day 5. Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the International Tropical Timber Organization, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, the Secretariat of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, the United Nations Forum on Forest Secretariat, the United Nations Development Program, the United Nations Environment Program, the World Agroforestry Center, and the World Bank. All of these members of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests participated in the Forest Day 5 Steering Committee. They helped with communications. They hosted the discussion forums as listed in your program, and they provided financial support. So all the times you heard C4 congratulated during the course of the day today, just do a global delete and replace with C4 and other members of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. Um, and of course, thanks are due to the UNFCCC Secretariat for contributing the Executive Secretary to our closing plenary. Fourth, thanks to all of the speakers and panelists who've given generously of their time and of their expertise in not only speaking today, but really planning to participate in today's sessions. Fifth, thanks to the many students from the International Forestry Students Association and Guttingen University. They were the guys in the blue t-shirts who told you where to go. They volunteered their time to help with the logistics of today's event. Sixth, thanks to the conference company for their many professional services in helping to organize and execute this event. And finally, I must express my deep personal gratitude to my colleagues at C4, who have done, as usual, the heavy lifting to organize Forest Day 5, staying up all night so I don't have to. And thanks also to those C4 colleagues back at headquarters in Indonesia and in our other offices around the world who stayed behind to keep the lights on while so many of us get to be here. So please join me in a round of applause to recognize all of these contributions. As those of you Forest Day veterans who were left standing in the uh, plenary polling this morning, it's been quite a journey since we launched the first Forest Day at COP13 in Bali. We had originally planned on a relatively small science-oriented event, and then more than 800 people showed up. 
The summary of our discussions on that day has been credited with informing the inclusion of forests in the Bali Action Plan and specifically the second D in red. A year later in Poznan, 900 people came together for Forest Day 2. And in Poznan, the emphasis was on the urgency of including forests in the global forest protection, the global climate protection regime, and the importance of managing forests for livelihoods and biodiversity, and not just for carbon storage. Some of you may have special memories of the cocktail party and the trays of vodka shots that came around, but maybe we can discuss that later. At Forest Day 3 in Copenhagen, we directed our energies towards ensuring that the design and implementation of the forest-related climate change mitigation and adaptation policies were effective, efficient, and equitable. Then at Forest Day 4 in Cancun, the theme was Time to Act, kicked off with a great speech by President Calderon. I mean, I thought I had died and gone to heaven to have a head of state speaking passionately about the underlying drivers of deforestation. And we like to think that it energized him on forestry issues for Mexico's leadership in the COP in bringing red across the finish line. And today, at Forest Day 5, we've put the nexus of forestry and agriculture firmly on the agenda, and we're making the transition from politics to implementation, in Tony Navinia's words, or according to our theme, from policy to practice. Now, you'll forgive me for signaling out as the quote of the day from Odiga Odiga, if you didn't come to Forest Day, you missed the cop. Gotta love it. We now have a tradition in place, a formidable alumni network, and I think a sense of responsibility for maintaining the momentum on forests and climate change issues from the International Year of the Forests onward into Rio Plus 20. Now, why am I taking this opportunity to recount the history of Forest Day? As some of you may know, I recently announced my intention to step down as Director General of C4 by the middle of next year. And shepherding forest days over these years has been one of the highlights of the position and a role that I will certainly miss. So I can only hope that I'll be invited back to participate in future forest days as a civilian. Now, I'm keenly aware of the business that remains unfinished for the forests and climate change agenda. We still got to accelerate political agreement and liberate the flow of financing. We still got to more effectively link science to policy and practice. We still got to redress the imbalances and attention given to mitigation versus adaptation and to humid forests versus dry forests and to afford gender issues the attention they deserve, to name just a few. But take heart. As Odingo Dinga said, we have the opportunity to witness transformational change. And if there's any country in the world that gives us hope for the possibility of transformational change, it's this one. But in the meantime, perhaps another quotation from the sign at the skating rink is in order. An appropriate way to provide encouragement on our common journey to build forests into the climate change agenda is a tip offered to beginners on, state, on skates. Take small steps and always lean forward. So with that, I'm told that Eduardo Rojas Briales has a closing message before we formally close for the cocktail reception. Eduardo. Delegates, dear colleagues, good evening. I was not planning to intervene, but the sad news that Francis shared with us just a few seconds before, uh, ask uh, some intervention from my side, and uh, the fact that she is leaving C4, and as well the leadership of this very impressive five forest day, uh, devotes comments from my side. Francis Seymour has been an inspiring engine, and in some way the mother of the forest day, one, two, three, four, and five. If women make a difference in many cases, this is the proof. Researchers, and she comes from the research position, frequently have a tendency to close themselves in ivory towers. But this is not the case in the case of Frances Seymour. She has worked very strongly in bridging science and practice in order to achieve uh, that forest issues, and especially those who are more burning, like deforestation, 
come into the political agenda. And there is a triple bridge, because she has been as well bringing the, uh, the decisive element for getting it happen, which is communication. So it has been a triple bridge from strong knowledge of research, from uh, practice, and as well from communication. Her communication skills have been really extraordinary. Behind huge uh, moving forwards have been, of course, strong collective efforts. And it is very impossible to find pa paternity or maternity behind them. And there is frequently, especially in the concept of ideological progress, high convergence. You know from the biological part that there is the term biological convergence. Vegetation in the drylands of Southern Africa or Australia or the Mediterranean, be it climate in California and Chile or real in the real Mediterranean, show very high similarities regarding coming from different families, what we call biological convergence. The reaction, you see the leaves, the structure, they seem very similar regardless they come from different families. We have the same when we have big challenges, that people coming from different places develop a kind of ideological conversion. It's difficult to say who was the first. The important thing that by the team effort, it happened. So one of the key figures, for sure, of RED is Francis Simon. So I would like, on behalf of the 40 CPF members, and she quote them, I won't repeat them, to thank you very expressively for our strong appreciation to what Francis Simon commitment and contribution, and wish you all the private and professional success for the new steps you're taking over in your home country. Thank you, Francis, for your huge commitment. sit down again, just like I did this morning. So as Eduardo knows, at my last speaking, speaking engagement in Beijing a couple of weeks ago, um, I, my speech followed a speech by Miss Earth, you know, a beauty pageant winner. And I'm thinking, I'll never compete with that. But ha, I've got my you know, bouquet now. So, so, uh, I, what can I say? You guys are too kind. It's overwhelming. Thank you, Eduardo, and, and to all of you. So I'll, what can I say? But it's now my pleasure to officially close Forest Day 5 and invite all of us out into the lobby to celebrate our five years of working together and our intellectual convergence, is that what it was, uh, in making a contribution to Forest Day and to the forest and climate change agenda tomorrow and then in the future. OK, see you out in the lobby.